Listen in this interview when Hale talks about not one, but two of the rock bottoms he had in his life. Also, what did Hale's friend John tell him that gave him more clarity in two minutes that he experienced the previous six months? Also, he talks about his five-minute rule that you have to listen to. There were so many takeaways in this. What did someone get tattooed on their arm because of what Hal said? That and much more right now. Hey, Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Hal Elrod. He's better known as Yo Pal Hal. He's the author of the number one best-selling book, The Miracle Morning, which I read and is fabulous. And he's one of the top youth, college, and corporate speakers in the country. From Fortune 500 companies like Countrywide and Fidelity to high-profile youth organizations, including Boys and Girls Club of America and youth advocate programs. I looked at his schedule the other day. He travels all over the place. Hell has inspired tens of thousands of people during the past 10 years to overcome life's adversities. And you'll hear in his story of, of why. And he creates extraordinary results in life and business. Hal, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's, uh, it's an honor. So many people talk about how we have so many things stopping us from what we really want out of life. You know, everything from being too young, too old, not experienced, too little money, no family support, health issues, and so many more. And obviously, when people hear your story, um, they really will realize how do they can overcome some of these personal challenges. Can you talk to us about one of those or two of those really painful moments in the past for you? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that I've been fortunate to have what you might call two rock bottoms in my life. And what I mean by that is, you know, points for you to the point where we all have those points where we look back and go, dude, that was my rock bottom. And I feel like it's happened kind of twice for me. Um, the first rock bottom was when I was 20 years old. Uh, I was uh, one of the top salespeople for a, for a direct sales company. When I was driving home from after giving a speech, and I was hit head on by a drunk driver at 70 miles an hour and found dead at the scene. Um, two cars hit me. Uh, I, I broke 11 bones on this side of my body, and it took them almost an hour to use the jaws of life and pull me out of the car. And when they did, I, I had bled so much, lost so much blood that I bled to death. Right. And my heart stopped beating. Um, I stopped breathing. And I, uh, I was uh, rushed to the hospital after they revived me dead for six minutes and then in this coma for six days where they had to put metal rods, plates in my eye, rods in my arm, screws in my elbow, plates in my leg. And I woke up from the coma six days later to just the most unimaginable reality, wondering why, you know, it's, why am I in this, this hospital room and who are these people? And, um, you know, thank God my family was there. But that was kind of really the first rock bottom is I had to make some major decisions on this is life. Like I, I you know, what, what am I going to do with this? And they told me I would. They, they thought I would never walk again, and I had permanent brain damage that was so bad that you know, Jeremy, you could visit me for three hours at the hospital. You could go to the restroom and come back, and I would not know that you had been there for three hours, and I would start talking to you, you know, about this accident I was in. Wow. Um, the second rock bottom was about eight years after that, uh, when the economy crashed in 2007, 2008. And you would think it, it doesn't get worse than, you know, dying. Exactly. And, That's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm like, you have another one? This is... Yeah. It, well, and really, the second one was worse, in my opinion. Um, and, and I can, I'll explain why that is in a second. But basically, my, my business started failing because half of my coaching clients, I was a life and success business coach, half my clients couldn't afford to... Pay, like, their businesses were failing, and they couldn't afford to pay me. A lot of salespeople. And um, I, all of a sudden, I went from... I just bought this brand new house. My wife and I were, you know, like everything was great. And to couldn't pay the bills, going in debt, living on credit cards, ended up $50,000 in credit card debt, losing my first house. And um, the reason it was worse than being in the, in the accident in the hospital is in the hospital, people, I had what human beings need more than anything, which is love. I had my, my family and friends and you know doctors and nurses and people were just taking care of me and loving on me and encouraging me. And in 2007, 2008, nobody was taking care of me. No, you know, it's like I was on my own and it was a, it was lonely and it was fearful and losing my house and all those things were just I, I felt so hopeless and afraid and out of control. 
And so that 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 rock bottom to me that was worse than the first, and you know both presented different challenges. And I think the second one is one people can relate to more, right? It's not like I was the only one where the economy or the recession has affected that, you know, them in, in that way. Right. So how did you overcome the, that low point? Well, you know the 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 second low point, um, uh, it was I, I went for a run. I actually was talking to a friend of mine. I I, I wasn't telling anyone. See, I was so. By the way, to be real clear, I was, for the first time in my life, I was depressed. Like, I didn't want to get out of bed depressed. And I had never been depressed. Like, I was always a pretty happy person. I mean, a little depression growing up. Like, I got broken up with my girlfriend and, you know, it, but nothing like this, where I literally had thoughts of, I didn't know what to do, you know? And um, I, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And I, I finally confessed to a friend what I was going through. And I didn't want to tell anyone because that was the other thing that made this so hard. I was a life coach, yet I was failing, right? It's like, it was such a, like, I had to get on the phone and tell people to succeed, and I felt almost like phony because I'm like, I don't know how to succeed right now, and I am, I just, yeah, I was I was depressed to where the only, the only thing I looked forward to every day was just going to bed. It was like, if you ever had that feeling, I don't know, but where you just under the covers, like, this is the only safe place where I feel right. like I can escape my problems for eight hours, right? And so I didn't want to tell anyone that I was failing because, again, I was a coach. And I finally confessed to a friend, and uh, my friend John, I said, John, I, I got to talk to you, man. I, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I'm, I'm living on credit cards right now. We're, I'm not making enough money to pay my bills. We're probably going to lose our house, and I don't know what to do. And John's advice was so remedial that I was like, I, was, I, was, I thought he was being really lazy. Because he's a coach, he's a real successful coach, and he goes, "Hal, are you exercising?" I'm like, "That's it, dude. That's your. That's what people pay you a thousand dollars a phone call to tell them that I should exercise." I go, "No, I'm not exercising, man. I can't even get out of bed in the morning." Yeah. He said, "Hal, you need to exercise." He said, "You've got. If you don't exercise, you're going to keep thinking at the level you're thinking at, and you're not going to get out of your problems." He said, "You need to change your state, get out the door, and get more oxygen to your brain so you can gain higher levels of clarity." Get blood to your brain for the same reason, right? Get your blood flowing, you know. And I was desperate, so I said, okay, I'll do it. And the next morning, I laced up my running shoes, which, uh, actually, I take it back, sorry, they were my Air Jordans because I didn't even own running shoes because I, I wasn't a runner, I hated running. I go for the run, and I pulled my iPod out, which I was about to sell for food. You know what I mean? It was that bad. Huh. And I'm listening to a Jim Rohn audio, and Jim Rohn says a quote that I've heard before, but it, it, it didn't hit me before. And sometimes you have to be in the right place, right? Tony Robbins says it's either inspiration or desperation, moments of either that our breakthroughs happen. And I was desperate. And Jim Rohn said on this audio, your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person you become. And I literally stopped running and I rewound it and I listened to it again and it hit me. I wasn't becoming the person that I needed to be to overcome my challenges and create the levels of success that I wanted. And it was this epiphany, and I thought, i got to dedicate time every day to, and again, this isn't rocket science. Anybody could have given this advice, but I'm like, I need to focus on development. I need to be reading and journaling and, and doing affirmations and visualization and all these things, and obviously exercise, because, I mean, it's amazing. Two minutes of exercise gave me more clarity than six months of depression, right? Two minutes of exercise. And so I ran home, and I looked at my schedule. I'm like, I've, I've got to do personal development every day. But the challenge became, first challenge was when. I'm like, I, I'm busy all day long. I wake up, and I go to work, and I work my butt off, and then I go home, and I'm exhausted, and it's my only time to hang out with the, the wife or watch TV. Right. And as I'm looking at the schedule, I'm looking at, 5 a.m. Because that's the only time I could wake up earlier than my normal time. But I'm thinking, you got to be crazy. I'm not. Who wakes up at 5 a.m.? I'm not a morning person, right? I, I, don't, I can I'm, relate to that. Yes. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially when I'm like, I'm, I'm depressed trying to get out of bed at, when I have to, let alone earlier. And then I hear my one of my mentors, Kevin Bracey's voice in my head. He says, "If you want your life to be different, you have to be willing to do something different first. And I was like. Damn it. <laughs> he's right. You know, he's right. And at 5 a.m. with my, like, quivering as I went to my schedule, 
I wrote personal development at 5 a.m. And I pulled the pin back, and then the next challenge became, what the heck am I going to do for that hour, right? Like Tony Robbins calls it your hour of power. And I started just brainstorming, what are all the things that I've read about that I should be doing? Haven't we all been told that we should review our goals every day, and we should write in a journal, and we should, we should um, visualize, we should meditate, we should write all these things. And I wrote down six practices, and I thought, what if I do 10 minutes of each the next day? 10 minutes of each, all six, and all of a sudden I started to get excited. I thought, what a cool way to start my day. And it, what's amazing is, think about this, Jeremy, I went from being depressed for six months that it was the first time in six months that I had, I had like hope. And it was self-created. It wasn't that anything changed outside of me, right? It was that it changed inside of me. It was that I changed what I was going to do. And, and that night, going to bed, did you ever celebrate um, Christmas growing up? Well, we celebrate uh, a, f a form of Christmas, but yes, okay. Hanukkah, so Christmas, other, yeah. Uh, we'll use the example of like your birthday or a vacation, like a vacation. You ever been on vacation, right? For you sure. Know, the night before, you like you you can't wait to wake up and you know go to the airport or or, or get, hit the road, and so that night, that's how I felt. I was like tossing and turning out of excitement to wake up, very different than it had been for the last six months, and the next morning the alarm went off, and it was one of those, you know where. You open your eyes so fast, you feel like you almost opened them a millisecond before the alarm went off. And I jumped out of bed, and I went into the living room, and I had those six practices written down. I had, I had a book ready to go. I had a journal ready to go. And, and some of the other practices were meditation, affirmations. I didn't even know how to do those. So I just Googled how to meditate, and I'm like following the steps, okay? Close your eyes, okay? Right? Don't think about anything. I'm like, oh, this, this is hard. And long story short, an hour later at 6 a.m., I had never felt so at peace with my challenges, so inspired by my possibilities, motivated to take action, energized through the exercise that I had done that morning, and I literally had the best day of my life that I had had in six months' time, and it was only 6 a.m. Wow. And I was like, wow, this is a gift I can give myself every day. And so I did. And within two months of doing my morning, I call it, I now call it the Miracle Morning. You know, it's my new book. Um, but within two months, I had more than doubled my income and basically started to move myself out of all those, those financial problems. And, and I was, a ha I was happy. I was happy again. I was motivated. I was inspired. That's amazing. Yeah. And even if someone does one of those things and to see where you went from that, one of those low points to the proudest moment. What's one of the most pivotal moments that you attribute kind of getting on that path for success in your mindset? Um, so I think that it started for me back when I was in the hospital. Uh, the doctors actually called my parents in one day, unbeknownst to me. Now keep in mind, this was about two weeks after my accident, and six of those days I was in a coma. So I had been out of a coma for about a week. Huh. Um, doctor said I'd probably never walk again. So I'm laying in my hospital bed. I mean, my head is shaved. My ear was almost completely cut off. It's hanging on by a half of an inch. It's sewn on. I've got three metal plates in my eye. The top of my head, they had to sew back together. My arms got metal. I mean, I'm just, I'm a mess, right? I'm laying in a hospital bed. I'm, you know, You're I'm like the pain. Terminator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'd think I'd be stronger than I'd pick up cars or something. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, or the million dollar man, right? right? We will rebuild him. So. Jeez. Um, the, so the, the, the doctor calls my parents in, and it was my physician and my neurologist. And again, I didn't know this was, this was happening. And they sat him down and they said, we're really concerned with Hal. Um, we, we believe he's in denial. This is very common with accident victims that it's so painful what's happened to him emotionally to, to accept that he's just in denial and pretending it didn't happen. They said, because every time we're around Hal, he's always smiling and laughing and making us laugh and the doctor said that's not normal not for someone that's been through what he's been through you know he should be sad angry you know depressed that that's normal response so he said we want you to go talk to him because you know right now he's distracting himself with humor and stories and TV and friends but they said when he gets out of the hospital and he's not in this protective environment that could turn to drugs and alcohol and reckless behavior 
So we want you to get him to admit how he's really feeling so he can feel the pain of the experience and go through it. And so, of course, my parents were concerned. And my dad comes in, and I'm in the hospital bed again, not knowing any of this happened. And my dad, turn, he says, Hal, can we turn off the TV and talk for a second? And I said, sure, Dad, what's up? And he turns off the TV, and he gets real serious, kind of somber. And he says, Hal, we haven't really talked about how you're feeling, you know, about this whole thing. He goes, I, I know when your friends are here, you're laughing and you're joking and you're, you're you know, you're, you guys are reminiscing and telling stories. He said, but how are you really feeling? Like when they leave and the lights go off and it's just you by yourself and your thoughts, how, what, what do you, how do you feel about this? Are, you know, are you, are you sad? Are you angry? Are you depressed? It's okay if you are. It's normal. And I could tell my dad was really concerned, so I really thought about his questions. I thought, am I sad? Am I angry? No? Am I depressed? You know, and I, I really tried to get in touch with that. And, and I realized, no. And I said, Dad, I thought you knew me better than that. I live by the five-minute rule, which is something I learned in my sales training, which says it's okay to be negative, but not for more than five minutes. Like, you know, you're going to get rejected, things are going to go wrong, you're going to fail, etc. But there's no point in dwelling on it for long periods of time. And so I said, Dad, I learned, remember I learned that in my training, I said, I, I'm applying it to this. I can't change it. I can't change what happened to me. Feeling bad about it doesn't fix it. It doesn't make it better. In fact, it just makes it worse. And I said, I'm going to have to learn to walk again. I'm going to have to, you know, learn to use my brain again. I'm going to have to learn all of the, you know, my speech was slurred at that time. I said, I'm going to have to learn to talk again. I might as well do that being happy and grateful for what I have rather than depressed about the things that are out of my control. And he, he was almost, you know, a little in disbelief, I think, and he said, are, are you sure that's how you feel? I said, Dad, yes. I can't change it. It's been more than five minutes. My time to feel bad for myself and feel sorry for myself is up. You know, and I think that was a pivotal moment because, and I, I developed that that strategy of accepting things I couldn't change to accepting life before it happened. Meaning, I decided that no matter what happened to me in my life, from that point forward, I would never wish it didn't happen. Because that was putting energy into something that created emotional pain in the form of regret or anxiety or sadness or depression or anger. And I thought, I'm accepting all things before they happen. Now, it works for the most part. Obviously, a few years later, it wasn't as easy as you know, it's easier said than done. When um, uh, when when I you know when I lost my income and all that, I did go through depression. But I would say that 99% of all challenges that have come my way since then, um, everything from you know being in traffic and going, oh, why aren't you going faster? It's like I can't change their speed of the cars. So I accept them unconditionally. You know, I think that was the greatest lesson I learned because it allows me to move through challenges with, with thinking intellectually versus being emotionally distressed. Right. No, I mean that's that's a powerful thing. And so, going from that, what would be one thing you'd recommend the audience do right now to get started in overcoming their some of their personal challenges? Obviously, everyone's in different situations, but. Um, I mean, I think it starts with it starts with acceptance. In fact, if you guys want a resource, go to can'tchangeit.com, and I've got a free video up there. There's a 10-minute video of me. It's actually a clip from me giving this in a speech live, um, and uh, you can watch. And it's you know, totally free. You don't have to opt in. Nothing. You just go there and you can click play. And I wrote an article that explains the philosophy. Um, but I really think that that's the starting place: is accepting all the things that we can't change. And when you do that, and I actually have wristbands that I don't have the one on right now, but it says can't change it, right? Or, that constant reminder, it. yeah. Yeah, and I don't wear it anymore because I, I did wear this for years, but it's so ingrained in me that I don't need it anymore. But um, I, I, I have these available like when I speak, and I'll tell you, this is crazy, Jeremy, but um, a gal emailed me, uh, it's probably a year or so ago, she was a college student, and she said, Hal, she emailed me a picture of her wrist. And after she saw me speak, she bought a wristband. And after she used the wristband for a few weeks, she said it had such profound impact on her life, she went and had it permanently tattooed on her wrist. Wow. 
And I had two thoughts. Number one, that's powerful. Number two, that's in like <laughs> kind of cuts, you know, it's kind of crazy. I was like, yeah, that's a little permanent, right? Um, just keep the wristband. <laughs> right. but here's the crazy thing. I thought this was a one-time occurrence. In the last year or so since that email, I've received four different emails from four different people that are not interconnected that have had can't change it tattooed on their wrist, wow. their shoulder, their foot. And the most compelling one, Jeremy, was a gal emailed me and said, how I said yesterday was the 10-year anniversary of my father's death. He died at, I think it was like 43 years old. Wow. And she said, up in, you know, every day I cry I, for the last 10 years. I've felt sad over my dad. I've wished he were here. I've gotten angry that he was taken so soon. And she said, it wasn't until I heard your speech that I realized I was creating emotional pain in his memory. It wasn't his death that was causing me the pain. It was the fact that I wasn't willing to just accept it and be at peace with it. She said, so I got in, in his memory, I got those three words, can't change it, tattooed in my wrist, as a m reminder that I will never cry painful memories over the things I can't change, especially my father's death. I'll only think of him with loving memories and with gratitude for who I am as a result of, of, of what he was in my life. And it just made me realize that everything from getting stuck in traffic to losing the most important person in your life, those three words, can't change it, ch it ironically, they change everything, right? right? They can't change it, changes everything. Yeah. So what's... um. Yeah, thanks for sharing those. That's amazing. Um, I mean, that powerful that someone's going to tattoo something on their body. Yeah. <laughs> What's uh, a system uh, that you use in your life and business to kind of maintain this? Because obviously, you know, we do it for a day, but oftentimes we kind of fall off the wagon. What's What's a system or routine you use? Um, well, you know, it, it goes back to something I mentioned earlier, which was kind of that turning point when I realized that Jim Rohn quote, you know, your level of success will rarely exceed your level of personal development. Uh, and then I dedicated time every morning to my personal development. Well, once I did that, um, I started teaching it to my coaching clients. And most of their response was, oh, Hal, I, I'm not a morning person. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't like getting up in the morning. But because I'm their coach, I have a little bit of influence over them. And they were like, I, they would all admit, okay, I'll do it for a week. And I remember Katie. Katie was the first person that I, it was like two months after I had done this, this uh, coach or this um, morning routine. I don't know if I was calling it the Miracle Morning at that point. It, that, that name eventually came about because it changed my life so fast it felt like a miracle. But Katie on a coaching call goes, Hal, what time do you wake up and how do you start your day? She said, I just read an article that talked about how important having a morning routine is. And as she's asking me this, I'm beaming. I'm like, oh, I, oh, I can't wait to tell you what I've been doing. It's, it's changed my life. And so I tell her about my morning routine, and uh, she goes, I'm not a morning person, but I'll try it. Uh, a week later, I get on the phone with her, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, you know, her hesitancy, I'm thinking, she probably threw in the towel, maybe did it for a day. And I go, Katie, I go, so how did your, how did your, you know, how did the, the miracle morning go this week? Did you, were you able to stick with it, you know, for, for the week? And she goes, Hal, I was only able to get up at, uh, at 6 a.m. for, uh, for for the first two days. I go, okay, that's better than not at all. She goes, no, no, no. Listen, it was you were right. It was so good. I felt so motivated, inspired, energized. She said that I wanted more of it. So I got up at 5 a.m. for the next five days. She goes, wow. so to answer your question, not only did I do it every day, I bumped it an hour earlier because it was so beneficial. And I have the same experience for myself. So Long story short, the Miracle Morning is the system. And it, you know what's interesting is almost any guru that you study, you know, any any expert like Robin Sharma, you know, has videos on how his morning routine is one of the the pinnacle, the crucial systems for his success. Um, Tony Robbins, same thing. The difference is, and the reason I wrote the Miracle Morning book is that. None of them focus on it as like, this is the thing. It's usually like, for example, Robin Sharma's like, here's how you have your best year ever. It's like a six video series, and one of them is about early rising, but for the other people, they don't compartmentalize it, and they get, it gets lost in the other right. five videos, and they don't do it. And for me, I realized this is not just like part of the process. This is the single most mm. important key to my success, is that I start every day focused, motivated, 
goal-oriented, and because of that, it makes my entire day that way. And every morning, by starting my day the way that I want to live my entire life, it's like my success is inevitable. So that's where I decided to write the Miracle Morning, and that's you know that for me has been the game changer. I've been doing my Miracle Morning for five years, um, and uh, you know, and there are thousands of I probably got I don't know thousands, but hundreds of emails uh, that I've got in my inbox from people that have said this has changed my life more than anything else. Yeah, and that's like you said, a standalone thing. If someone just did that, it's so powerful. So, Hal, before we end. Can you tell us just a little bit more about um, kind of what you have going on in your business? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> the Miracle Morning. Uh, if anybody wants to write a book that's watching this, by the way, and you've been putting it off, just get started. And you need some accountability. I got some. I hired a, a coach to just hold me accountable to write the stupid book, but because it took me six years, six years. Well, I should say it took me six years of like dabbling in it. Once I was fully committed, it six months later I had written the book. You know, became a number one bestseller, etc. So that book, I genuinely believe, based on not only my experience, but based on those hundreds of emails that I've gotten from people, um, and the Amazon reviews. You know, there's like 85 reviews on Amazon right now that are five stars that say this book changed my life. Like it's a total game changer. You know, so for me, I feel responsible to get the Miracle Morning like to, in a major way, get it out there. So that's my number one focus this year is. The Miracle Morning and sharing it with people. And by the way, if anybody wants, they can get two free chapters. Before you go buy the book on Amazon, you can go get two free chapters at MiracleMorning.com. MiracleMorning.com, two free chapters. But that's the mission. And then the second thing I'm focused on is, um, it's called VIP Mastermind Coaching. And it's I founded it. Um, I've been coaching for seven years. The challenge with individual one-on-one -on -one coaching is two things. Number one, it's, it's relatively expensive. You know, on average, of five hundred dollars a month for a couple calls, um, and it's limited. I like I, I always have a waiting list, so I can't. You know, I'm, I, I hate your time is limited. Yeah, like, yeah. It's I, I can only fit twenty clients, and I get thirty five requests, and you know, narrow it down to twenty. So about two years ago, I started a group coaching model, and I was kind of experimenting. I did it with one company, and over the last two years, we've had six hundred people go through it, and it's been amazing. So I just this year opened it up to the public. And it's called a VIP Mastermind Coaching. And so now it allows me at a much lower price point to coach a lot more people. But I don't water down my coaching. That's what I always say. It's not like I'm like, all right, it's group coaching, so I'm only going to give you 50% as good as I could. You know, it's, No, this is the best coaching I have on topics related to becoming the person that you need to be to create the levels of success that you want. So... Um, and again, that's at VIPMastermindCoaching.com. So those are the big focuses, and I'm still I speak at high schools, colleges, corporations. So I've kind of got a lot of, you know, juggle a lot of a lot of balls, yeah. Yeah. So where can thank you so much for sharing all this, Hal? Where can people reach out and just thank you and and kind of check you out a little bit more? Um, my brand new website, uh, HalElrod.com, H-A-L-E-L-R-O-D.com, HalElrod.com. You can you know contact me through there. That'll go straight to me. Um, and uh, and then yeah, you can obviously watch videos and you know learn learn more about me as well. Okay, right. thank you so much, Hal, and I hope all of you go out and thank Hal and uh, check out his website. And I read his book, absolutely love it. And I uh, even woke up earlier this morning, and incorporated some of those things in my life. So we can all learn and improve for sure. So thank you so much, Hal. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Jeremy. Thank you.